Hello, and welcome to the 41st Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure and privilege of welcoming poet Kyle Carrero Lopez, who has curated a fantastic lineup of poets and performers for us today, featuring Jessica Abugatas, Anais Duplain, Omotara James, I.S. Jones, and Fargo Nassim Tabaki. We've started out all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wapinger, Canarsi, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. The second is an acknowledgement that Black lives matter. And it's worth saying that the heart of both of these acknowledgements is a commitment to the liberation of the oppressed and solidarity for all those who struggle for freedom. In that spirit, I encourage you all to check out the chat, the living document of resources and actions that we've been putting together behind the scenes here at The Rail. Um, and if you have any recommendations for things to add, uh, drop them in the chat. Um, but we'll get right into it. Now it's my honor to welcome our wonderful curator, curator, poet and author of the upcoming chat book, Muscle Memory, uh, which will be released with Pank in August of this year. Uh, we'll drop a link to pre-orders shortly. Kyle Carrera Lopez was born to Cuban parents in Northern New Jersey. He co-founded Legacy, a Brooklyn-based production collective by and for Black queer artists, and his eminence can be found in the form of poems published in Tri, -tri Quarterly, The Atlantic, Poetry Mag, The Nation, and elsewhere. Uh, Kyle, take it away. Hi, everyone. Thank you so, so much for being here. Um, I've, I've been excited about this for months, and um, it's really wonderful to see the turnout. Um, so when I got this invitation and was considering what constitutes radical poetry, uh, what left to the forefront for me was the shared experiences of policing faced by Black and Palestinian thinkers who have sought to speak to um, on realities of subjugation. To give just one example of many, in 2014, Palestinian American professor Stephen Salaita was denied a tenure appointment at the University of Illinois after tweeting criticisms of the Israeli government with documented evidence that this termination decision came about due to pressure from wealthy donors. The political organization Canary Mission regularly makes the names and pictures available of people and groups that are critical of Israel on North American college campuses, frequently targeting Palestinian Americans. Hawk-like surveillance and subsequent punishment bind Black and Palestinian peoples together. And we must also acknowledge that these groups are not separate, that Black Palestinians continue to navigate the dually crushing forces of settler colonialism and anti-Blackness. Malcolm X and Black power groups of the 1960s, like the Student Nonviolent Coordination Committee, identified vocally with the Palestinian struggle. And we hope today's reading can carry that spirit forward. So, I'll be beginning with a poem by June Jordan. Apologies to all the people in Lebanon, which is dedicated to the 600,000 Palestinian men, women, and children who lived in Lebanon from 1948 to 1983. I didn't know, and nobody told me, and what could I do or say anyway? They said you shot the London ambassador, and when that wasn't true, they said so. What? They said you shelled their northern villages, and when UN forces reported that was not true, because your side of the ceasefire was holding since more than a year before, they said so. What? They said they wanted simply to carve a 25-mile buffer zone, and then they ravaged your water supplies, your electricity, your hospitals, your schools, your highways and byways, all the way north to Beirut, because they said this was their quest for peace. They blew up your homes and demolished the grocery stores and blocked the Red Cross and took away doctors to jail and they cluster bombed girls and boys whose bodies swelled purple and black into twice the original size and tore the buttocks from a four month old baby. And then they said this was brilliant military accomplishment. And this was done, they said, in the name of self-defense, they said. That is the noblest concept of mankind. Isn't that obvious? They said something about never again, and then they made close to one million human beings homeless in less than three weeks, and they killed or maimed 40,000 of your men and your women and your children. 
but I didn't know and nobody told me and what could I do or say anyway? They said they were victims. They said you were Arabs. They called your apartments and gardens guerrilla strongholds. They called the screaming devastation that they created the rubble. Then they told you to leave, didn't they? Didn't you read the leaflets that they dropped from their hotshot fighter jets? They told you to go. 135,000 Palestinians in Beirut. And why didn't you take the hint? Go. There was the Mediterranean. You could walk into the water and stay there. What was the problem? I didn't know and nobody told me and what could I do or say anyway? Yes, I did know it was the money I earned as a poet that paid for the bombs and the planes and the tanks that they used to massacre your family. But I am not an evil person. The people of my country aren't so bad. You can expect but so much from those of us who have to pay taxes and watch American TV. You see my point. I'm sorry. I really am sorry. All right, so I'm really excited to introduce our first reader, Ayas Jones. The queer American Nigerian poet Ayas Jones writes the hell out of a poem. Her words are masterpieces of gorgeous lyricism and intense personal admission grounded in family, heritage, passionate love, and queer defiance. Her debut chapbook, Spells of My Name, will be out later this year. Please join me in welcoming I.S. Jones. Ooh, damn, Kyle, that was one hell of a reading. That was one hell of an introduction. Thank you. I am reporting from the desert. So if my internet is a little spotty, that's why. I'm very grateful to be here. I'm very grateful to stand with those who have been displaced from their homes, whether it is um, Palestinians, um, Black people in the diaspora. What I, I don't want to talk too much, but I really have it on my heart to say is that I'm really grateful that at least it seems to be the case, the narrative is shifting in which um, Israeli forces who have actively brought harm against Pal Palestinians are no longer able to hide behind a false anti-Semitic narrative when we call out the violences of Israel. Um, and you know, I maybe I am too hopeful, but I think hope is really important right now. May Palestine be free in our lifetime. With that, I want to begin um, with a puzzle for the diaspora by Files by Faisal Mohidin. We have always been the displaced children of displaced children, tethered by distant rivers to abandoned lands, our bloods, histories lost. To temper the grief, imagine your father's last breath as a mogul garden, marble floor at its center, the mirrored sky holding all his tribe had lost. Above the tussle of his wounded city, sad-eyed paper kites fight to stay afloat. One lucky child will be crowned the winner, everyone else will have lost. Wish peace upon every stranger, who arrived at your door, even the thief, for you never know when your last chance at redemption will be lost. In another version of the story, a steady loneliness mothers away the rust. Yet without windows in its hull, the time traveler's supplication gets lost. Against flame-lipped testimonies of exile erasures, the swinging of an ax, Felled banyan trees populate your nightmares, new enlightenments lost. The rim of this porcelain cup is chipped, so sip with practice caution. Even a trace of blood will copper the flavor, the respite of tea now lost. Tell me, Faisal, with what new surrender can you evade deeper damnation, whatever it is? hack away before your children too become the lost. And I'm gonna read three poems from my Working Full Length collection. 
husband, child, etymology of Cain. The first return of spring I could remember, mama took me out to the landscape, said burrow your hands into the soil and listen. So I did. I am daughter and husband, sister and mother. My name means she who creates, crafts, forms. The world I wanted most was one that would bend at will. I didn't understand this as a child when my first narcissus wilted in the heat. It was the law of my home. Because I'm older, my sister does as I tell her. First born, third parent, mother of my own haunting lack. Was I ever a child or a surrogate to salvage my parents' union? My hands have come to know the wet dark intimately. My parents only touch at night, plea each other's name. My sister calls me perverse and I say, how? Frogs envelope their softness into each other. Wild horses mount to their mates to undo an ancient appetite. The soil tells me as much. In my rage, I cursed the narcissus. It said, yes, Lord, then perished at my feet. I know what love is because I know what violence is capable of. Truth is, I have no husband habits. My mother weeps into her lap with her good eye unblackened by Adam's contempt. Baba, you have given me this dominion to master. You want perfection, yet you want the labor done by human hands. How do I win if there's no pleasing you? I didn't say it before. Well, I guess I could just say it. Yeah, the, the poems in my full length reimagine Cain and Abel as sisters. Between grace and mercy, we learn mercy so young, a beetle with its hind legs crushed, a dog impaled by a rusty fence, a rabbit thinking it was clever enough to reach the other side of the road, a veil of light drapes each moment, red, tangerine, azure, lavender, each waiting to reimagine the sky. The beetle frantic to undo what sudden brute force divided its legs still moving towards a song. With the beetle, it was simple. Cain crushed the small creature with the heel of her foot splayed open like a wish. People think suffering is meant to be purposeful. Otherwise, why name it? Maybe I'm nostalgic for what wounds best. The rabbit and tire and asphalt. Asphalt gowned in viscera makes a new animal. A dog leaps too low and yelps all evening for Baba into the orange pink sky. All day blood weeps into the rust. Rust twisted deep into the animal. I take the dog's face in my hands. Touch is the body's first language. Blood is the body's first covenant. Kill it, says a sister. You kill animals all the time. I kiss the dog's eyes closed. I have two more. Abel's Nocturne. Um, and this poem is after, after Audre Lorde, after Octavia Butler. I forgot to put it in my notes, but yeah. Abel's Nocturne. It comes to me when I struggle. Your hands learn a kind of mercy about my neck. How blood rushes to the center of departure. When I had to kill a lamb this way, Cain called it love work, the ritual of hands tightening against faith. Above the surface of flesh, I thrashed against mommy's cool touch, returning again to that dark grasp. It comes to me when I struggle, not Cain, but something she did to me that only blood has language for. What will time do to this body that she hasn't already named? Let me present myself plain, old master. In the dream, I walk for miles in a dark forest. I wouldn't have known my own face if daylight handed it back to me. A soft hand snakes about my throat and it is my sister's face I see on the other side of the trail. Some animals show mercy by devouring their lovers. Oh Lord, honeyed by fireflies, blood drips from your chin and I know it is my own. Making real the dream of my suffering, the sun drags its headless body across the sky like a monument of war. And my final poem is from the genius 
brilliant, amazing, fantastic, wonderful person who I can never say enough beautiful things about, George Abraham, who is a genius, who is very, del who is very deliberate and militant about their actions um, and who I feel very honored to call into this space, who largely in part, my chapbook would not exist if not for their continuous and endless encouragement. Um, Ars Poetica in which every pronoun is a free Palestine. And so it is written, the settlers will steal God's land in free Palestine. We'll curse the settlers with an inability to season free Palestine's food. A sun burned the shape of the settler's dictator, of the settler dictator's face, and every body untanned who will claim free Palestine's earth, but not free Palestine's skin, soil stained. There, free Palestine said it. No one really owns anything free Palestine didn't unwrite to make it so. Free Palestine sea, Israel. Free Palestine sky, Israel. But but not free Palestine's thunder. The blame will always be free Palestine's and this and so this will be called an accurate history. The expanse of free Palestine's visibility willed in bloody cloth or paper, free Palestine's longest suicide, free Palestine will die in jail and become Israel. Free Palestine will die in protest and become kite on fire. Free Palestine will call Ham Hamas, fable of every headline, Israel falafel, so dry free Palestine could start an infatata with it. <laughs> Headline, <laughs> Israel falafel, so dry free Palestine could free Palestine with it, no. Free Palestine will never give Free Palestine self a name not rooted in upheaval. Free Palestine's hyphenated by settler flag. Free Palestine hyphenated by settler pronouns. Free Palestine will not pledge allegiance to Arabic or English. Free Palestine will exist in no language. Free Palestine will write poems of all tree and checkpoints and no free Palestine to be found. Free Palestine will name the violence and never the resurrection. Like free Palestine hasn't survived the impossible histories to get here. It is written, the blood will be on free Palestine's hands. Might as well paint free Palestine's nails while free Palestine's at it. What? This is not what Free Palestine expected? Did Free Palestine not think Free Palestine would have the last laugh all along? My bad, y'all, my internet connection went out for a quick second. It's now my great pleasure to introduce to you all um, Jessica Abugadis. A debut, her debut collection, Strip, won the 2020 Ebel Anon Poetry Prize, selected by Fatty jo uh, so sorry, I'm gonna mispronounce this, Fatty Joda and Hayan Chachara. She was a Kudiman Fellow, and her poems have appeared in the Rumpus, the Adroit Journal, Tupelo Quarterly, Lit Hub, Waxwing, Boats, and other places. She lives in Los Angeles. From the comfort of your seats somewhere quarantined, please give it up for Jessica Abu Gaddis. Hi everyone, good morning, West Coasters. I'm joining from Tongva lands, uh, and I'm so grateful to my fellow readers, and I'm grateful to be in this space with all of you, I'm gonna read just a few poems um, that feels authentic to me today. I'm gonna to start with a poem by June Jordan, who is one of my favorite poets and I am honored to read her words. Moving towards home, it begins with a quote, where's Abu Fadi, she wailed, who will bring me my loved one. The New York Times, September 20, 1982. I do not wish to speak about the bulldozer and the red dirt not quite covering all of the arms and legs, nor do I wish to speak about the nightlong screams that reached the observation posts where soldiers lounged about, nor do I wish to speak about the woman who shoved her baby into the stranger's hands before she was led away, nor do I wish to speak about the father whose sons were shot through the head while they slit his own throat before the eyes of his wife. Nor do I wish to speak about the army that lit continuous flares into the darkness so that the others could see the backs of their victims lined against the wall. Nor do I wish to speak about the piled up bodies and the stench that will not float. 
nor do I wish to speak about the nurse again and again raped before they murdered her on the hospital floor. Nor do I wish to speak about the rattling bullets that did not halt on that keening trajectory. Nor do I wish to speak about the pounding on the doors and the breaking of windows and the hauling of families into the world of the dead. I do not wish to speak about the bulldozer and the red dirt not quite covering all of the arms and legs because I do not wish to speak about unspeakable events that must follow from those who dare to purify a people, those who dare to describe human beings as beasts with two legs, those who dare to mop up, to tighten the noose, to step up the military pressure, to ring around civilian streets with tanks, those who dare to close the universities, to abolish the press, to kill the elected representatives of the people who refuse to be purified. Those are the ones from whom we must redeem the words of our beginning. Because I need to speak about home. I need to speak about living room where the land is not bullied and beaten to a tombstone. I need to speak about living room where the talk will take place in my language. I need to speak about living room where my children will grow without horror. I need to speak about living room where the men of my family between the ages of six and 65 are not marched into a roundup that leads to the grave. I need to talk about living room where I can sit without grief, without wailing aloud for my loved ones, where I must not ask where's Abu Fabi because he will be there beside me. I need to talk about living room because I need to talk about home. I was born a black woman and now I am become a Palestinian against the relentless laughter of evil. There's less and less living room. And where are my loved ones? It is time to make our way home. I'm gonna read a poem of my own strip from my book strip. Uh, Hello to Sol Masjarif, who I don't know if you remember years ago at Tin House, I brought a very early version of this poem to your workshop. Thank you. I'm so glad you're here. Strip. To remove all contents or possessions from, to empty completely, a sequence of images telling a story, a main road in or leading out of a town, a long narrow shape, especially of a woman to tear the thread or teeth from, to dispossess, leave bare, remove all coverings, to press the eggs from, a splayed fish, to gut, to remove bark and branches from, an olive tree, to remove the midrib from, the sleeves, to milk, a cow, to the last drop, to barefoot the child always drawn from behind, to deprive someone of, to take away from, confiscate, to rob, ravage, ransack, raid, reeve, rifle. To fire a bullet from a rifled gun. To rip the sheets from a bed. To lay bare, devastate, sack. To tease, example, prisoners down to their underwear. To denude, delude. To divest, to remove the fittings of or take apart a machine. To inspect it, to adjust it. Example, tank, piece by piece. To dismantle, disassemble, demolish, deny. To take to pieces, take to bits, take apart, break up. To recall El Dawema, Dear Yassin, Hula, Tarshiha, Jish. To clear, clean out, loot, pillage, plunder. To, often polemically, insist on nuance. To paint Guernica upon a camp entrance. To make the body believe lies about itself to hear over a megaphone in one's native tongue, today's judgment day, to, to sell off for profit, to use for or involve in performance, to hundred dollar bill, to entertain, to scatter like the people of Sheba, to desire no sense of permanence, to undress suddenly and into the dead, dead sea. And, um, I was in a, a celebration of Naomi Shihab Nye's poetry and, and career a few days ago. And so I was thinking about this poem, Blood. 
A true Arab knows how to catch a fly in his hands, my father would say, and he'd prove it, cupping the buzzer instantly while the host with the swatter stared. In the spring, our palms peeled like snakes. True Arabs believed watermelon could heal 50 ways. I changed these to fit the occasion. Years before, a girl knocked, wanted to see the Arab. I said we didn't have one. After that, my father told me who he was. She had, shooting star, a good name borrowed from the sky. Once I said, when we die, we give it back. He said, that's what a true Arab would say. Today, the headlines clot in my blood. A little Palestinian dangles a truck on the front page. Homeless fig, this tragedy with a terrible root is too big for us. What flag can we wave? I wave the flag of stone and seed, table mat stitched in blue. I call my father. We talk around the news. It is too much for him. Neither of his two languages can reach it. I drive into the country to find sheep, cows, to plead with the air. Who calls anyone civilized? Where can the crying heart graze? What does a true Arab do now? That's all I've got for today. And now I have uh, the honor of introducing Anaïs Duplan, is a trans poet, curator, and artist. He is the author of a book of essays, Black Space on the Poetics of an Afro Future, a full length poetry collection, Take the Stallion, and a chat book, Mount Carmel and the Blood of Parnassus. His video works have been exhibited by Flux Factory, Data Editions, the 13th Baltic Triennial in Lithuania, Matthew Gallery, Newhouse, the Paseo Project, and will be exhibited at the Institute of Contemporary Art in LA in 2021. As an independent curator, he has facilitated curatorial projects in Chicago, Boston, Santa Fe, and Iceland. He was a 2017-2019 Joint Public Programs Fellow at the Museum of Modern Art and the Studio Museum in Harlem. In 2016, he founded the Center for Afrofuturist Studies, an artist residency program for artists of color based at Iowa City's artist-run organization, Public Space One. He works as a program manager at Recess. And um, it's really lovely to be in this group of people today, um, reading work around um, conflict and power. Um, and power is something that uh, I think a lot about, um, specifically uh, ways that power often manifests in oppressive regimes as um, a sort of power over uh, uh, or power to limit uh, another group of people. Um, mm -hmm. And in, you know, resistance circles, whether that be sort of uh, resistance in terms of large scale political action or um, resistance on uh, and a sort of queer interpersonal level um, that there are these different manifestations of power that that show up in those situations. Um, and so I wanted to read just like a small excerpt um, from a book called A New Weave of Power, People and Politics, the Action Guide for Advocacy and Citizen Participation. Um, and it's a section that is kind of uh, listing uh, different expressions of power. Um, also, before I get any farther, um, I'll say that uh, I, my name is An. I am a trans uh, masculine person wearing a blue shirt, um, calling in from a studio space in the basement of the Luminary, which is in St. Louis. Um, and I'm calling in from uh, Kickapoo land. Um, so yeah, I'll read these expressions of power and then um, I'll read some poems of my own as well. And I'll just let you know when I'm switching. Expressions of power. To get a handle on the diverse sources and expressions of power, both positive and negative, the following distinctions about power can be useful. Power over. The most commonly recognized form of power, power over, 
has many negative associations for people such as repression, force, coercion, discrimination, corruption, and abuse. Power is seen as a win-lose kind of relationship. Having power involves taking it from someone else and then using it to dominate and prevent others from gaining it. In politics, those who control resources and decision-making have power over those without. When people are denied access to important resources like land, healthcare, and jobs, power over perpetuates inequality, injustice, and poverty. In the absence of alternative models and relationships, people repeat the power over pattern in their personal relationships, communities, and institutions. This is also true of people who come from a marginalized or powerless group. When they gain power in leadership positions, they sometimes imitate the oppressor. For this reason, advocates cannot expect that the experience of being excluded prepares people to become democratic leaders. New forms of leadership and decision-making must be explicitly defined, taught, and rewarded in order to promote more democratic forms of power. Practitioners and academics have searched for more collaborative ways of exercising and using power. Three alternatives, power with, power to, and power within offer positive ways of expressing power that create the possibility of forming more equitable relationships. By affirming people's capacity to act creatively, they provide some basic principles for constructing empowering strategies. Power with has to do with finding common ground among different interests and building collective strength. Based on mutual support, solidarity, and collaboration, power with multiplies individual talents and knowledge. Power with can help build bridges across different interests and transform or reduce social conflict and promote equitable relations. Advocacy groups seek allies and build coalitions, drawing on the notion of power with. Power to refers to the unique potential of every person to shape his or her or their life and world. When based on mutual support, it opens up the possibilities of joint action or power with. Citizen education and leadership development for advocacy are based on the belief that each individual has the power to make a difference. Power within has to do with a person's sense of self-worth and self-knowledge. It includes an ability to recognize individual differences while respecting others. Power within is the capacity to imagine and have hope. It affirms the common human search for dignity and fulfillment. Many grassroots efforts use individual storytelling and reflection to help people affirm personal worth and recognize their power to and power with. Both these forms of power are referred to as agency, the ability to act and change the world by scholars writing about development and social change. So that's that excerpt. Um, and then I'll read a bit of a new manuscript called I Need Music. I talk a lot about the empathic capability about I'm just gonna start over. I talk a lot about empathic capability in a class I'm teaching at Sarah Lawrence College on documentary poetics. Both the benefits and limits of empathy, the benefits are obvious. Empathy allows us to connect with each other more deeply since our devotions are such a huge part of our lives. Our lives are enriched by our empathic capacities, but there are times when empathy isn't plenty, when following or even healing along with someone doesn't lead to the action necessary to stop that soul from re-experiencing pain. It's not always our responsibility to stop others from feeling pain, but if we're to believe ourselves as empathic citizens in empathic devotions, it's heavy to see where our empathy leads in our family's WhatsApp group chat. My father told me, although he's anti-police, he's pro-policing that without policing, 
our society would descend into chaos. He's not the only soul who feels that way. A lot of folks feel that way. I used to feel that way at the heart of this as John Dewey sings in Art as Experiences, panic of what breath may bring forth, what breath brings forth is terrible, even fatal other times, breath affirming, joyful, how do we live in the midst of these extremes? What about the days when the best I can do is get up out of bed? I recently switched out my antidepressant medication for a new one because my old medication was making me too anxious. Now I don't feel anxious anymore. I believe I'm the least anxious I've been in my entire breath, but I feel depressed. I feel that our race is real, absurd, or illogical, and searching for logic can lead to a type of depression. There'd be so many instances that make no sense, except when we abandon logic for the absurdity of the race we're in. With that being said, I again choose the logic that gives our breath the most meaning. What science thinks started the 10 million things and going to end the 10 million things and how even now some folks are arguing that the Big Bang may never have happened. The laws of physics seem to make sense for me and the notion that energy can neither be created nor destroyed. And if that's the case, it's nice to make a mental image that the 10 million things never truly ends, we never truly die, etc. Everything else is too depressing and can lead to a wormhole of dark thoughts, such as if the race is going to end and the sum of this here going to one day cease to exist, let alone matter, why are we making it? Let me stop there. Um, thanks, y'all. I um, Next up is the sweet and beautiful Kyle. Kyle, Kyle, Kyle. So excited about Kyle. I'm not going to say too much about Kyle because you already heard about Kyle in the beginning, but just affirming my love for sweet Kyle. Um, and thanks again for inviting me to read. Thank you, sweet Ann. Thank you to all the readers so far. It's going, it's incredible. Thank you. Um, I'll just jump right into it. I'm, a few of the poems that I'm reading, I think uh, I have three or four. Uh, most come from my, my chapbook, Muscle Memory, which will be out from Pank in August. Charge it to the game, after Lucille Clifton. Has glamour lived without cruelty? They're twins, ex womb mates. The fish tails on this vintage McQueen blazer slap the turnstiles as my knees vault it. I bagged the cash for it, nude, watched by hundreds in a MoMA exhibition meant to mimic confinement, like in private prisons, an investment of the museum's board. The behind the scenes of our goods and greats, smears most all of them, gloss even, glitter even. Imagine being the first squid to spot microfibers in your hood, like first snow to a caveman. Imagine the morning of a guillotine. On hers, Marie Antoinette wore a white chemise, white gown, white cap tied with black ribbon, prunella shoes with sage green trim. Were you dealt future sight the day police would besiege you? What would you wear to your state sanctioned execution? I dream of an option to do no harm. I dream of bishop sleeves, of the whiz greens, of gold hoops, of rose quartz cufflinks, of tight bell bottoms. A new pair soothes all woes for two whole hours, and then the toll again. At home, a roach speeds out from behind the mirror. So I grab a white go-go boot and bash it. Each soul stuck leg seems so common now, like confetti once it hits solid ground. This next poem 
is called pink washing or useful faggotry. It begins with an epigraph. Israeli pink washing is a potent method through which the terms of Israeli occupation of Palestine are reiterated. Israel is civilized. Palestinians are barbaric, homophobic, uncivilized, suicide bombing fanatics. Dr. Jasbir Poir. I'll also say the speaker of this poem has been to Israel, I have not. The gays wanna know how my vacation to the settler colony went. What can I say? It was a lot like the settler colonial city I live in, but with a great desert flair. Street life was fabulous over there. The city's rainbow flags were a school of fish, obscuring of individual gills, spry, plentiful and efficient in their undulation. We passed security checkpoint after security checkpoint along the fringes of the settler colony, each playing a different era of Madonna. In the streets, men held each other's hands and not hands and smiled, sun-kissed, far off from thoughts of where they were or how or at what cost. Parties every night, of course. At the club, this one twunk in a harness kept shouting, we were lucky to be there. Under the molly, under the red lights, under the ceiling, under the missile defense system, and not at the fringes of the settler colony where gay hate chokes the air like smog. But there was a queer who kept trying to interject. There's queers at the fringes too, he'd start. Queers fighting for queers. Queers bombed while club queers decide which shorts to wear that night. Queers awash in reds of the flesh. And every time he'd try to speak, the EDM would just keep getting louder and louder, almost like the DJ was doing it on purpose. Um, so this next poem is called Imprints. Dark rings carve a fire island log. Light footsteps patch the trails of mud. Each oldest tree a woods heirloom, like a gold ring or trauma passed down. My father's father would punish him with kneeling on small beds of raw white rice, his dead load spread on knives of grain for minutes. Inside each minute, a gate to a minute and another and another till each contains 10 or 30 of itself. And when his father lets him, it takes time to stand back up, knees numb, all white and gnashed and red, left sectioned and thorned like pineapple flesh. And I've got just one more for y'all. Um, this poem is called Untitled Havana 2000. And it's after a piece of the same name by the artist Tanya Bruguera. Also begins with an epigraph. Queers, confirmed or suspected, were one of several groups of social deviants imprisoned and sentenced to labor following the Cuban Revolution. The Cuban government has since taken responsibility. And today, trans health care is provided to Cubans for free. Power falls twice. You're either rain or a worm reacting to it. To whom or what do you choose to bow? May Cuba live, island her own, free of U.S. of A. por siempre. Gusaneria, worms piling in the absence of light. You've entered now, your feet crunch mashed bagasse, 
The cool air whiffs, molasses wafts. Can you feel the humans here, each distinct from their rulers? No one name names the unnamed. Hands behind your head. You have the silence to remain right. You have the silence to remain right there between tooth and gum. To whom do you bow against your will? Look, looped video in darkened cove. All you see is leader smiling, leader in profile, leader hugging and kissing the masses. He bears his furry chest, sans bulletproof vest. Young Fidel, you would, and so would we. And what about young W. Bush or younger or older Obama? And there's that one Stalin shot. We see time after time how polite kind thirsts for stained palms on our star struck thighs. Once you walk away, what becomes of those who cannot? Gusaneria, light's absence, piling the worms. A man who thinks himself rain would claim any old flood was just. So now I have the pleasure to introduce Omatera James. Um, I was blessed to share an MFA cohort with Omatera James, whose poems are searing sonic marvels, prayers towards queer utopia. Omatara is the author of Song of My Softening, forthcoming in 2022. She believes that radical thought without radical action is dead. Please join me in welcoming Omatara James. Kyle, thank you so much for your reading, uh, that introduction, but really just for curating this beautiful, beautiful reading. Um, and thank you so much, Malvika, for running a stellar, stellar reading. Um, I am grateful to be here, grateful to uh, the Brooklyn Rail. And so much I want to say. Um, so I've been reading lately uh, the work, the translated works of a uh, Palestinian poet, uh, Najwan Darwish. And I've been also looking at um, some of his interviews. And in one of them, the interviewer asked him, um, are you the poet of your generation? Um, you know, what do you think about the other poets of your generation? And, and he said something that uh, authenticated my experience, which is um, that he belongs to the older generation. His work belongs to older generations. And it's not for him to say, uh, you know, if his work, you know, what generation he's from. Um, so that idea of uh, belonging and being in debt is an idea that I think is central to connection because aren't we all connected not only to the wisdom of the generations before us but also to their follies um, we're connected uh, by love but we're also connected by violence uh, if you believe in good and evil it's all connected it's all our inheritance and it's what's happening today it's what connects us and um, what we repeat and, and we see that. And so I was thinking about how essay, the form of essay, the genre examines that, but in poetry, we, we experience that. We experience empathy. We experience one set of experiences rubbing up against another. And I don't know about you, 
but I'm cons consistently just asking myself, why do I do what I do? <laughs> I'm always in an existential moment. So I'm going to share uh, three poems by uh, Najwan Darwish with you uh, and a couple by me. And I'm gonna be thinking about empathy. I'm thinking about what I've heard so far in this reading. Um, and I'm gonna ask that you hold space to do that too, that you continue to hold space, not for just my words, but for what you've already heard so far in the reading. Lift every voice and sing, sing, sing. Till earth and heaven ring, ring, ring. At a poetry festival by Najwan Darwish, translated by Atif Alshir. In front of each poet, stands their country's name and behind my name, nothing but Jerusalem. How frightening your name is, my little country. For me, nothing remains of it except the name. I sleep and wake in it. Its name, a boat, with no hope of arrival or return. It neither arrives nor returns. It neither arrives nor drowns. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise. You don't know what you've got till it's gone. After a Mark Romanek video with Janet Jackson featuring Q-Tip and Joni Mitchell. We pivot like we pray for no gaze. Only black shines in its darkness and light. By which I mean on and on and on and on. Like steam. Music be how the message bodies to the sky is what I see in Janet's smile. She, brown and glittered golden, leathered in cool. Q-tip on the beat and Joni Mitchell never lies. Black be the thing you can never quantify. Catch us kissing and mending our bodies in the blue black. Catch us blasting and dutty whining in the lamplight. The summer, Miss Jackson teaches rhyme to hug its own line. My back bending, twisted towards sorrow all that time, waiting for song to arrive. High as the listening skies, let it resound loud as the rolling sea. Books Raised on Spears by Najwan Darwish, translated by Kareem James Abouzid. Who are these assembled nations? Who are these people raising holy books on spears, giving their food and drink to the ages, 
enriching the soil with their bodies surrendered to nature's law. Who's this woman on the nightmare bus? She's been riding it for generations and still hasn't reached her stop. Whenever one of her grandkids falls asleep, they find themselves there sitting beside her. Who are these Kurds, these Amazigh, these Armenians? Rotating names for a blade with the next one unknown. The names of victims are endless. Assembled nations, books raised on spears. My people are out there and I'm too afraid to open the door. Sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us. When I dream of escape, the voice of God says, bitch, wake up. Why are you sleeping? I gave you a whole life and entire earth of dirt. What is you doing? She hollers, don't make me come down there. Finish your work. Don't be careless. When she proclaims, I'm giving you three hours. I know I have three hours. To live like this under the threat of your own existence. Your pink tongue lapping at the far side of the bowl your neck fur drenched in your own frailty and so much water. There is no other God, no other order, no other place. Facing the rising sun, of our new day begun. Who remembers the Armenians? By Nadwan Darwish, translated by Kareem James Abuzid. Who remembers the Armenians? I remember them. And I ride the nightmare bus with them each night. And my coffee this morning, I'm drinking it with them. You murderer, who remembers you? Let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Um, this has been incredible. And to introduce our final uh, closing poet. Um, That's me. Oh, brilliant. Yeah. Go right ahead. So it's my pleasure 
to introduce Fargo Nassim Tabaki, a queer Palestinian American performance artist. His writing can be found in Strange Horizons, Apex Magazine, The Shallow Ends, Mizna, Peach Mag, and elsewhere. His performance work has been programmed at Outsider Fest, Intersection Solo Fest, the National Queer Arts Festival, and has received support from the Arizona Commission on the Arts. For more information, you can visit his website and let's all make space for Fargo. Thank you. A Gorilla Handbook by Amiri Baraka. In the palm, the seed is burned up in the wind. In their rightness, the tree trunks are socialists. Leaves murder the silence and are brown and old when they blow to the sea. Convinced of the lyric, convinced of the man's image, since he will not look at substance other than his ego, flowers, grapes, the shadows of weeds, as the weather is colder and women walk with their heads down. Silent, political rain against the speech of friends. We love them, trapped in life, knowing no way out except description or black soil floating in the arm. We must convince the living that the dead cannot sing. Thank you so, so, so much uh, to everyone who's here. Thank you, Kyle, for curating this incredible lineup. Thank you, Malvika and the Brooklyn Rail for making this possible. And uh, to everyone else with whom I've been able to perform today, um, it's just been such a reminder that the future is unoccupied and each one of your readings, each one of your poems is opening a portal to that future and inviting us to come through. So thank you. Of, after Milton, for and with George. My last obedience to the restraints of the language of bone breakers, to the tyranny inside the gloved hand, inside of, I dissolve it now. I offer it to you slaughtered like a purveyor of tear gas, gutted like a sustainer of museums. I beg you now, who from the last will be present, anchoring my every tooth, planted in a garden fertilized by the ashes of Kalundia. Rend my body, bring life to Arabs, bring water to wash my body of blood. I will be wrath of, song of, blade and flame of, tooth and nail of. I will entomb the remnants of a board of directors inside my own heart, your hands forgiving the debts of rule, translating the missives of scorpions, the homilies of Molotovs, breathing the desiccations of security cameras. You crater of tongue, you loveliness in retribution, tributary of unpriced goods of fire and ice, of a program to liberate, of the drowning of conquerors, of an endless intifada, you singer of a stone to the skull of a soldier. Here I beg you with libations of tanks, with offerings of hair, of loss, of the suit of a banker, of boots pride from the feet which carried a corpse to its nest at Columbia. I give you my fears and my hesitancies to cast into the depths to unlanguage I beg you, lower me, my heart, the hewn signature of a stonemason, bring me low. Unmake me roughly silica dust outlining my shape like an angel silent in the pool.
poisoned air. Steady my rifle aimed toward the killing of tree planters, the writing of sins, the breathing of earth, the dreaming of children, of this, of more. Sing, empty the earth of song to pour into my ventricled weapon. What is low in me, make sharp. What is hurt in me, make sharper. You made with earth and a million stomping feet. And what is light in me? And what in me is light? Palestine is a futurism. Emptinesses. My heart, when it is suffused with envy poison, legislatures, the sun shining out of our mouths, 401ks of salivating mayors, my eyes suffused with the reflected dead, gutted fish heaped on the side of the dock, the tunnel we dig to anti-textual bliss, 501c3s of exponential combat veterans, myths rendered in hyperdimensional color, the friends I jettisoned into gravity's insistent rule, garrets of consulting firms, peace corpses of riot cop therapists, my soul suffused with phosphores phosphorescence, my soul imbued with the peace of wild mustard. Palestine is a futurism, terrorism. The fear is in your heart, is in your banks, is in your eyes, is in your laws, is in your shoes, is in your clothes, is in your dirt, is in your... The name of the fear in your heart is Palestine. Let it eat your spirit whole. Breath is in your cars, is in your jails, is in your heart, is in your books, is in your salt, is in your pipes, is in your prose, is in your... The fear in your heart obliterates your accumulation. You have nothing. You are nothing. Bolts is in your food, is in your bees, is in your love, is in your ore, is in your lack, is in your heart, is in your plants, is in your... You must allow consumption of your feelings. The fear is yanking your death out. Heart is in your facts, is in your child, is in your heart, is in your heart, is in your knots, is in your heart, is in your heart, is in you. The fear in your heart is a futurism. Look, you are finally made of dandelions. You are glorious, useless. Look, you are beginning to be free. Thank you so much again for everything. Um, I'm gonna close with a poem by the Palestinian resistance poet, Sami Hal Qasim, called Enemy of the Sun. And this is a poem that when George Jackson was assassinated in prison, his possessions were confiscated and this poem was found among them. And for a long time afterwards, it was circulated by radical black groups in the United States as a poem by George Jackson. And only later was it accurately identified as a poem from an anthology of Palestinian resistance poetry. And I return to this historical moment often as a moment when the threads of black revolutionary leftist experience in the United States and Palestinian leftist revolutionary experience in Palestine crossed and were knotted together and formed the, the part of the net that is being added to and strengthened every day and that this reading is a part of. So, Enemy of the Sun by Sami al Qasim. I may, if you wish, lose my livelihood. I may sell my shirt and bed. I may work as a stone cutter, a street sweeper, a porter. I may clean your stores or rummage your garbage for food. I may lie down hungry, O oh, enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise and to the last pulse in my veins I shall resist. You may take the last strip of my land, feed my youth to prison cells, you may plunder my heritage, you may burn my books, my poems, or feed my flesh to the dogs, you may spread a web of terror on the roofs of my village, O enemy of the sun, but 
I shall not compromise, and to the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist. You may put out the light in my eyes. You may deprive me of my mother's kisses. You may curse my father, my people. You may distort my history and may deprive my children of a smile and of life's necessities. You may fool my friends with a borrowed face. You may build walls of hatred around me. You may glue my eyes to humiliations, O oh enemy of the sun, but I shall not compromise. And to the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist, O oh enemy of the sun. The decorations are raised at the port. The ejaculations fill the air aglow. In the hearts and in the horizon, a sail is seen, challenging the wind and the depths. It is Ulysses returning home from the sea of loss. It is the return of the sun, of my exiled ones. And for her sake and his, I swear, I shall not compromise, and to the last pulse in my veins, I shall resist, resist, and resist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Fargo. Uh, and thank you to everyone here uh, to close us out um, the way he opened us into this space. I'm gonna pass the mic over to Kyle, uh, our curator of this magical lunchtime. Um, thank you so much, Fargo. Thank you, Malvika. Um, I don't have too much left to say, except um, I, I'm just, I feel great, so much gratitude and I'm completely bowled over. Um, thank you. Thank you to all the readers. Thank you, IS. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Fargo. Thank you, An. Thank you, Omatera. Um, wow. So solidarity is about listening, and it's also about showing up. So in terms of, uh, I just want to leave you all with a few places that you can donate and a few things to read to keep the conversation going. Um, there's, you know, and I think Malvika is going to drop these links, but medical aid, you know, the, the situation in Palestine remains dire and part of showing up is, is supporting in those ways when you can. So there's medical aid for Palestinians, there's ANIRA, there's the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. And I also encourage you to read these two pieces on the poetry of Palestine written by Fadi Judah. So those are all coming momentarily. Absolutely, and as Fargo saying, whenever you can, however you can, organize for BDS. And that's all I got. I'll pass it back to Malvika. Thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Kyle. Um, I can't speak for the group. I can only speak for myself, but I'm. Uh, I think it is also valuable in these moments to to find your local SJP um, and donate to like those organizations doing the work on the ground uh, as well. Um, I'm going to post this uh, link that Kyle beautifully curated, the set of links uh, a few different times, because I know everyone's love is pouring in through the chat. Um, but I do want to say, just to close this out, thank you so much, Itiola, Anais, uh, Almatara, Fargo, and of course, thank you, Kyle, for bringing this all together, for having such a deep competency uh, and political conviction at this litmus test moment of our liberation politics. Uh, thank you for all of the invocations of George Abraham, June Jordan, um, so many, and I, I don't want to take up the moment to go through my notes. Uh, this has been truly a masterclass, and I, I want to highlight um, some things Fargo said. First, that he who desires power drinks of the salty water. Um, I know we're all uh, in, we're all too attuned to the news, the global cycle of the news these days. Um, but it's hard not to wake up and read, uh, you know, the news that Naftali Bennett bombed Gaza just you know, this morning, three days into his uh, administration, uh, which really shows, you know, the stretch of American politics uh, all over the world. Um, but thank you all so much. This has been really vital. Uh, as always, we'll share the recording of today's reading uh, on our archives, as well as on YouTube. So it will be available in a day or two if ever you'd like to revisit this space, I know I will. And please join us again tomorrow for What's With All the Prison Exhibitions. 
uh, when curator and educators Ashley Hunt, Rachel Nelson, and Lisa Polio jo joined prison activist Pete Brooke for a conversation on, I think, the space between prison abolition versus prison exhibition, prison as subject matter. Uh, we'll close with a reading from Jimmy Santiago Baca, and that will be as always at 1 p.m. right here in the Zoom. Uh, I'll drop a little link because that's a conversation we've been looking forward to. Other than that, thank you all so much. And I'll invite you to uh, turn on your microphones in case you'd like to say hello to one another, goodbye on your way out or uh, anything else that comes to mind. But thank you so much, Kyle, this has been incredible. Thank you to all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Kyle. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, really everyone. Amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you, Thank Thank you, you Father. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you so much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Lots of love and solidarity to you all. I really don't even feel like closing out the Zoom. Will we, will we echo? Not even. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you, and sure. thank you especially for having it in the middle of the week. The, rest, the remainder of the week is going to be perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very the much. The Wednesday works? Okay, wonderful. All right. Well, uh, have a beautiful rest of the day, everyone, and uh, stay in touch. Okay. Okay.